Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to today's update. Uh, I'd like to first uh, acknowledge on this Easter Saturday all of our essential workers who are uh, working today, uh, both in our hospital and healthcare settings and also around Australia. Uh, particularly difficult time to be working away from friends and family. And also acknowledging all Australians uh, who are uh, really doing exactly what we've asked of them uh, at this Easter break. So I can report to you today that the uh, total number of cases uh, is 6,290 and tragically we've had uh, 56 uh, deaths from coronavirus in Australia. The total number of tests is 340,000 that has been performed, still one of the highest testing regimens in the world. At this point in time, we have 231 Australians in hospitals uh, to, uh, and um, 75 of uh, those uh, patients are in intensive care units with just under 40 requiring ventilators uh, for support of their breathing. The total global total is 1.7 million and there have been 101,000 deaths. I'd like to make two uh, specific points today uh, in relation to two of the initiatives that um, the Australian Government have put in place um, to protect Australians um, during this difficult time. Uh, the first one, as you're aware, is uh, our um, reform of, the, of Medicare um, to expand telehealth. And telehealth to date has had over 3 million consultations with 2.4 million patients. Now that's important for two reasons. Um, the first one is that it means that doctors and patients have a way to interact that's obviously not face to face. Um, but more importantly, it means that those with chronic diseases in our community who require uh, interaction with their general practitioner are able to do so. Secondly, I want to mention our uh, mental health services. And although there have been a number of announcements by the Minister in the past weeks, uh, in particular the most recent, the Coronavirus Mental Health Wellbeing Support Service, which is being, uh, we are supporting through our colleagues at Beyond Blue. Um, and I would dire direct Australians uh, who are um, in need of support at this difficult time to the website www.coronavirus.beyondblue.org. And just before I take questions, I uh, want to make a particular um, statement about uh, how difficult this has been um, for Australians, in, in particular during this difficult time over the Easter break. We uh, have asked you to change the way um, we live as Australians essentially overnight. And essentially overnight, uh, we've come together as Australians and done just that. And it's because of that reason that we can continue to give you um, for several days now, and including today, um, good news about the number of cases that are, uh, are occurring. But we need to sustain those gains. We need to keep those number of cases low. Uh, we need to have that uh, opportunity now to chart our way uh, through and out the other side of this COVID-19 uh, epidemic. With that in mind, I can take some questions. Doctor, first, if you would, you talk about uh, the very good numbers of COVID cases in terms of the whole population. I understand healthcare workers' uh, infections in the state of Victoria have doubled in roughly the last week. Isn't that evidence that we're not doing enough to protect healthcare workers in this crisis, and how concerned are you about that trend? Well, we're concerned about every single case of COVID-19 and every single case needs to be investigated thoroughly, but in particular, those amongst healthcare workers need to be thoroughly investigated. We need to understand how precisely how the healthcare worker acquired that infection. Uh, we need to know exactly the circumstance. And I know that the state and territory public health units, particularly those in Victoria and New South Wales, are looking very closely at healthcare worker infections in those states. We discussed healthcare worker infections today at the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee, and we are making every effort that we can to understand how those uh, infections were transmitted, including using um, molecular techniques that can tell us exactly which patient the virus came from and who they were transmitted to. Do you believe that a lack of masks 
uh, might play into this in some way. Uh, I, I know the government has announced increased uh, efforts to get masks to healthcare workers. Is it a factor or is it nothing to do with the problem? I don't think it's a lack of masks or PPE is anything to do with these current situations in Victoria and New South Wales. As we said, the national medical stockpile has been releasing millions of masks, not only surgical masks, but N95 masks for airborne protection. So uh, the number of masks within the Australian community and healthcare community at the moment is sufficient and we're supplying them in uh, very large quantities to the states and territories, uh, including over 11 million that have come in during the past week. So no, I don't think that's a factor. Dr Coates, in terms of talking about sustaining the gains and keeping people at home, Department stores like IKEA and Bunnings are, are still open. Is that sending mixed messages? Is IKEA an essential service right now? I, I don't think it's sending mixed messages. I think that you know, to, to keep Australia at an appropriate level of social distancing, we do need some things in our community running. So whether you're talking about IKEA or whether you're talking about Bunnings, um, people still need to furnish their homes, do their repairs, they still need to call tradespeople around and so on and so forth. So that sort of thing needs to continue. And we do know um, that the uh, local managers of those stores and, and Australia-wide are actually putting in social distancing um, restrictions within the stores themselves. I was at Bunnings the other day, it was very clear where I had to stand um, in order to maintain distance. So I think you can do both of those things and um, I'd like to thank the Australians who are going to those stores for maintaining the distance and the stores themselves for putting in those, uh, those rules. Around 100 Australians have been evacuated from the Red Waterlogged cruise ship in Uruguay. Uh, what are the medical concerns? Uh, they're preparing to be brought back to Australia, to, to Melbourne. What are the medical concerns about uh, bringing back travellers uh, from somewhere where there has been a, an outbreak of, of the illness? Well, there are obviously medical concerns about doing that, which is why this um, entire operation has been meticulously planned, led by um, the cruise ship operator, but with support from the Department of Health, Department of Foreign Affairs, Australian Border Force, Victorian Government. Um, this is a very important thing that we have to get right, um, but equally we have to bring these Australians back, particularly when um, our understanding is that over 70% um, of the just over 100 Australians that are coming back have tested positive to coronavirus. So I'm aware of the detailed plans to uh, meet um, that aircraft when it, it arrives tomorrow morning, um, make sure that all the passengers get a thorough, thorough medical assessment at airside, and then depending on that medical assessment, uh, either go to hospital and that uh, the hospitals are prepared for that, or go into hotel um, quarantine. Um, Doctor, over Easter we've seen people largely staying at home from regional and rural towns for their holidays, which is, which is good, I guess, but given the older demographic that's concentrated in some of those regional areas, is there any uh, further work being done or any concerns that you have about the need for um, continued lockdowns out of those towns, given the older demographic that's concentrated there, but also coupled with potential single points of community transmission, like, you know, one petrol bowser in town, you know, one supermarket checkout, that sort of thing? Well, I think the first thing to say is that the, the, the lack of um, movement towards rural and regional towns at the moment is another fantastic example of how Australians are really listening to what we're asking of them. Uh, the second part of your question, um, the specific vulnerability of um, rural regional towns based on um, the age uh, of their population is a very real issue. Um, and so we uh, are aware precisely of where our intensive care units are uh, nearby, um, uh, supplying support to hospitals, supplying support to the Royal Flying Doctor Service to make sure that if there are cases um, that they can be treated either um, at, uh, at those hospitals or evacuated to, to one of the major centres. So um, it's, uh, with regard to the point about um, a single petrol bowser or supermarket, I mean, I think that the, the key is they will be um, unusual routes of, of transmission and that provided that um, the people who uh, are within those towns are observing exactly what we're asking of them, then, then that shouldn't be a major issue. Doctor, I understand the NRL now has written authority from the New South Wales Government to resume its training and its competition. Do you, uh, are you fully comfortable with the New South Wales Government giving the NRL that authority? 
Well, as you've pointed out, it's, uh, the authority is a, is a state matter. I think at the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee level, we have to be, um, have a, an approach that covers all codes. And, and at this point in time, it is that we don't have training and we don't have matches and we, we keep social distancing, um, which is the object of, uh, of not having those sporting events. We do understand, though, of course, um, that sport is a major part of the Australian psyche. So it will be one of the, as we see this curve flattening, it's logical that it, it's coming up as one of the first things that we, uh, that we need to address. But as you, as you worry, uh, as you hold the position that there should not be sporting training and competition, that's got to worry you, hasn't it, that position from the New South Wales government? Well, I might leave that to the New South, Gov uh, New South Wales government uh, to discuss more fully with you. Would you support the uh, resumption of the AFL at the same time? Well, we're not looking at uh, what's going to happen in, in that amount of time, I'm afraid. I, as we've said, we've said constantly, um, this is a day-by-day, -day, but week-by-week -week matter. Doesn't that send the opposite message to that, though, that the New South Wales government will commit to the resumption of training and the competition right at the time you're saying to the public, we've got to keep going, we can't open up yet? I'll have to leave that for discussion with the New South Wales government. Uh, pathologists have reported a sound 40% drop in routine testing. Uh, what's your message to Australians about um, still being able to go in and get that routine testing in and how important is that at this time? So I mean, I think at a broad level, um, you don't want other underlying health conditions to get worse because people are afraid of COVID-19. Um, this is an absolutely critical message and I would say to Australians that because they've done so well in, in flattening this curve, the chance of you actually encountering someone with COVID-19 when you get your pathology test is actually extraordinarily low. Um, so, you know, if you want to get a pathology test, if you want to get an influenza vaccine, if you want to do something there where the face-to-face uh, -face contact has to be there, then by all means go and do it, um, but just follow exactly what we've been saying. If you've got a cold, don't do it on that day. Um, if you need to discuss things with your doctor, get in touch with them via telehealth first. And is that, uh more critical for people who do have those chronic underlying conditions? It's absolutely critical. We, we don't want people missing out on their routine blood tests that they would use to check their kidney function or their diabetes or any, any uh, of a number of health conditions. It's absolutely critical. Doctor, what is the number you need to see more than any other? The number or the, the indicator you need to see more than any other that will allow you to say to government you can begin to relax the restrictions? What's the, what's the telltale indicator for you? There's no single telltale indicator, and I think we've been very clear about that, that there are a whole range of things that we can consider on a daily basis. But I think um, Professor Kelly was very uh, clear yesterday that one of the important indicators is the number of uh, cases that you get as a result of one case, that so-called basic reproductive number, and we want to um, try and see that uh, less than one. But that is but one of many indicators that we're going to use, including modelling, including various other indicators. So there won't be a specific day that I can say, because we have passed that threshold, it is time to relax uh, restrictions. That, that is not the way it's going to work. Dr Coatesworth, on the AFP recruits who are being investigated for social distancing breaches, do you think there should be some sympathy for them given that they already live and train so closely together? Is this an example of where some rules could or potentially need to be relaxed? Well, I think the first thing to say is that um, a lot of these rules, when they're pragmatically implemented, um, are very difficult. Um, every single Australian, not just AFP recruits, has, has found that a, a real challenge. Um, whether it's an example of one of the early things that we can relax on, um, I think that's just a matter that we have to consider uh, again on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, I just want to um, really um, concentrate on that point of of when we can relax these sort of restrictions. This is a, a matter that we have to sustain um, the quality of our response so we can continue to give you um, low numbers every day, but it's certainly too early to be um, talking about relaxation at the moment. It is something that we're thinking about. A couple of experts have said to us, Doctor, that it, it was very fast into the restrictions. It will have to be very slow out of the restrictions. Fair comment? Do you agree? I think uh, and 
It's a, it's a one way to put it. Um, I think another way to put it might be it was very fast into the restrictions and they were very widespread. It needs to be very nuanced on the way out. Um, so you need to be very clear about if you're lifting a restriction that you've done everything that you can to understand precisely what the implication of that uh, lifting will be um, before you actually implement it. So whether it's slow or not, um, it needs to be very targeted and focused and that's how it's going to be, I suspect. Doctor, do you have any detail you can share on the thinking that's going into that targeted lifting of, of restrictions? You know, any services or activities that might kick in first or later? That well, look, you can imagine that it's, it's two weeks um, since uh, we've been saying we introduced the, the very severe res restrictions. Um, and so it would be um, no option is on or off the table at the moment. Um, any, any range or combination of options uh, we're considering. And uh, when we've come to a conclusion on that, we'll be presenting it to National Cabinet. Doctor, the indicators you've seen on the behaviour of Australians just over this Easter weekend, obviously longer term, over the few weeks of restrictions you're happy, but just this Easter weekend, are you happy? And might, do you think there is a, a reasonable chance we will actually see a bump in COVID numbers in a week or two's time that you will go, right, that was Easter and that was people who weren't distancing properly? Well, no, I mean, we're, we're very happy with what we're seeing Australians do around Easter. We've got to uh, remember that this is, this is a holiday time. Um, we've asked Australians to um, break um, a, li a lifelong habit um, this weekend. And so whilst um, I acknowledge that there have been isolated instances where people might not um, have either understood or been, um, uh, been following the rules, I, I don't think that's a, a widespread concern. As for what might happen in 14 days, um, we just have to return to the same uh, mantra, which is we're not speculating on what's going to happen in the 14 days. Um, what we're aiming for is that um, the, uh, the news continues to be good. Dr Kozman, can I just ask a couple of questions for press gallery colleagues, not here because of social distancing measures. Would the government consider allowing Australian companies to produce medicines normally made by Indian and Chinese companies to avoid a shortfall? At this point in time, uh, we're monitoring medication shortfalls and shortages very, very closely. And in fact, it's something we do in usual routine business, uh, regardless of COVID-19. We're, we're not aware of any current shortages or any likely upcoming shortages. Um, whether um, uh, specific medications could be um, manufactured in country, um, that would be a matter for discussion with the um, Therapeutic Goods Administration. So at this stage, there's no concern about shortfalls for medicines like insulin or, or other kind of essential drugs at this stage? No, for essential non-COVID related drugs, there's no concern about shortfalls. And just one other question, should nurses and doctors have their registration fees waived this year as a goodwill gesture? Well, look, um, as a, as a practising clinician, I sort of have a conflict of interest in answering that <laughs> the question, Excellent. I suspect. Um, but look, uh, my, my view is that that is something that um, we would have to take up with APRA at this point in time. Can I also just ask you another crystal ball question, which we've been throwing at you. But going into winter, is there any concern that uh, COVID-19 could ramp up again? Well, there's no evidence at the moment or limited evidence about a seasonal effect for COVID-19. Um, the concern about winter, of course, is that there are other respiratory viruses, most notably influenza, that we know have a seasonal component to them and do get worse during winter. What I can tell you, though, is that with all the data that we've got on um, tracking flu in the community, with the social distancing that Australians have been doing, those numbers are, are plummeting. Um, which is just another great indicator of why um, this, is a, this policy is actually working and that Australians are, are doing what we're asking of them. Oh, and sorry, I had one more question, actually. Um, in terms of the new cases, I know you outlined the overall cases, but do you, are you aware or are you able to tell us exactly how many new cases there have been since yesterday? Uh, I did have that written down and uh, I'll have to take that on notice. I'm sorry about that. One more question before we go. Good. Okay. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Easter.